All right, so the first thing I'm going to do today is take this HS1016 horizontal stabilizer stringer web, uh, Clico it up in here to the stringers themselves, and use this angle drill number 30 uh, and go through and match drill all the holes that are common to the stringers and the stringer web, as well as the holes that, uh, you know, on these flanges up in here between the stringer web flanges and the ribs. And uh, so what this does, you know, the stringers and stringer web sort of create a, you know, a partial third uh, spar in the horizontal stabilizer. So, uh, you know, add strength to that center section. Uh, the plans don't tell you to deburr this first, but I think at this point we, uh, you know, we can kind of assume it's kind of implied. So I'll uh, peel the blue vinyl off and clean up the edges. They're, they're not too bad anyway, but I'll get going on that. All right, well, so as you can see in a minute here, I start out using the uh, 90 degree drill attachment in my pneumatic drill, but then I end up uh, switching over to just use my cordless electric drill. And I don't know why, but that seemed a little easier. Those, a 90 degree drill attachment in a regular drill is just a little clunky to use, I, I think. Maybe I'm just uncoordinated with it, but um, you know, you're having to hold the drill and then you're also having to hold the, the 90 degree attachment so that it doesn't just, you know, spin around. And uh, I'm actually thinking I might just go ahead and buy a dedicated 90 degree pneumatic drill. And, you know, they aren't cheap, but, uh, you know, tools. Um, so anyway, but, uh, you know, this went fine. Like I say, it's just a little clunky using the little 90 degree attachment. All right, so the stringer web is in place and match drilled to the stringers and these inboard ribs. And I went ahead and marked it so I'd be able to get it back uh, in place in the right orientation after I take it apart to deburr and prime it. So now it's time to match drill number 40 all the holes uh, in the skin common to the skeleton. So obviously that's a lot of holes and I'll probably take a sharpie and make little marks on the, uh, on the blue vinyl here as I go along so that I don't miss any. Uh, there's also some holes that are for fairing screws, so I'll want to uh, mask those off so that I don't end up accidentally dimpling them. And there's also some holes that are strictly for the tip fairings and uh, not in common with the skeleton, so I won't need to drill those or do anything with those at this point. All right, well, so suffice it to say, this is a whole lot of time lapse of a whole lot of me drilling a whole lot of holes. Uh, it was about 11 or 12 minutes of time lapse. Uh, I've shrunk it down to just a couple. And, uh, you know, this is a time where having a whole lot of Clecos really uh, pays off. Whether you need them that, you know, space that closely or not, it, it uh, helps, you know, helps keep track of where you've drilled and where you haven't. So... Um, you know, I don't know how many Clecos I have at this point. I'm, I may have over 500. Uh, I, I know I ordered, you know, the 300 some odd Clecos that you needed, uh, that the plans say you need. And when I ordered some of those, there were some that were out of stock and I got some different ones. And then the ones that I originally ordered came in. And so all in all, I've got, you know, probably 500 and I'll probably end up buying some more. I just don't think you can, I don't think there's such thing as having, uh, too many Clecos, at least the 332nd size. But so anyway, the uh, the strap-based cradles were probably helpful and an advantage, being able to move things and shift things around. They are wider, I think, than if I had made the cradles per the plans and and made them out of plywood. Uh, either way, they would have obscured some of the holes, and I'd have to shift things around. Uh, again, you can see me there moving the cradle around, and it was kind of finicky with the straps getting caught on Clecos and stuff but all in all it wasn't too bad and and uh you know you would have had to do that regardless of what the cradles were made out of so I think the, the freedom of being able to tilt things around and you know shift things a little a little easier probably paid off but so yeah uh you know this took uh, I lost track of how many hours this took but just a whole lot of drilling and moving Clecos and drilling again Okay, so I've done all the final drilling of the horizontal stabilizer skins to the skeleton. Uh, it took a while, it was a lot of drilling, but I think I got all the holes. I put tick marks by them as I went along, uh, and I've gone back and inspected, and everything that's supposed to have a tick mark has a tick mark, so that should mean they're drilled. 
so that's good. Now that everything has a, a direction to it, right? So this is the top of the left-hand side uh, of the horizontal stabilizer and top of the right-hand side. So now that that's sort of set, I need to go and on the top side identify and mark uh, using this rivet plan here the holes along this inboard rib uh, that are going to be for the fairing screws because I don't want to dimple those. So I'm going to go ahead and you know count very carefully, mark those off. I'm just going to mark them with a sharpie for now, and then I'll I'll come back and once I've taken everything apart, I'll mask them off with uh, tape before I peel the blue vinyl off. So. Uh, that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, so everything is mass drilled or final drilled as the case may be uh, that I need to do up to this point. So now I get to take everything back apart. And I think some people find this step to be kind of demoralizing. You've got this thing, it's starting to look like a piece of an airplane, and then you got to go undo it all. Doesn't really bother me yet, at least. Um, I just, I know it's one one step in the process. So uh, I've got everything marked that I think needs to be marked in terms of its either position or orientation or both. I'll double check as I go just to make sure there's nothing ambiguous or any of that. But um, yeah, uh, that's next. So I suppose a more creative person would put these uh, bits of the time lapse to music, but uh, you know, I'm not that creative of a person. Nothing real tricky here. I uh, took the rear spar out first, and uh, then the center section with the end spar ribs attached to the front spar and the stringers and stringer web all in place. Uh, so it kind of comes apart the same way it went together, uh, with the exception of the stringer and stringer web uh, assembly now being uh, part of the main center section there. And then uh, I just moved all that stuff to the other room and, and took it apart later. And then of course with the nose ribs being the only thing left in there, the skin wants to spread back out because of these cradles, so I just used, uh, used tape again uh, to hold the ends of the skin together to not put so much pressure on it when I took the nose ribs out. And uh, like I say, then I just went in the other room and took apart the rest of the skeleton, made sure I had everything marked in there, and uh, that was it. Okay, so the horizontal stabilizer is disassembled, and now I've just got a ton of holes to deburr. So I'm going to take this a little bit at a time over the course of the next several evenings, and, you know, no big deal. I'll spread it out. Uh, everything is extremely well marked. I probably went a little overboard with the Sharpie, but when I go to prime these parts, I'll clean them with scotch -Brite, uh, gray scotch Bright dipped in acetone, and that tends to pretty much scrub off uh, the Sharpie marks, and, and it just leaves this kind of a, this ghostly image of, of the mark, and it's uh, it's enough to figure out what the part is, uh, but it won't be, you know, quite so gross. And, uh, of course, most of this is, none of this really is going to be visible once the plane is assembled. I did take care to not put any marks on the outside of the skins, and, uh, you know, even these parts that will be visible until the fairings are on, again, so what? So... I'm going to get going on the deburring. So, if only the deburring could really be done uh, as fast as the time lapse. But anyway, uh, you know, as I said, I would just come down after work on an evening and deburr a little bit, listen to a audiobook or something. And, uh, you know, it's fairly mindless, so, you know, as you can tell by the change of wardrobe, uh, this was over the course of several nights. And, uh, you know, I, like I say, it's fairly mindless. I don't mind doing it. Um, uh, I use a couple of different tools. I'll, I'll talk about it more in a minute. But uh, I ended up buying a couple of little extensions for my hex bit there. I was just using one that I already had. But uh, I use that to be able to reach across, you know, when I'm deburring the underside, the holes on the underside of the rib flanges, and you need to be able to reach across the other flange. Uh, and I suppose one way you could do it would be to take, you know, the little deburring bit itself in your fingers and hold it square up under there. But boy, would that that would take forever. I've never uh, heard of anyone doing it that way. So you know, what I do is put some kind of an extension on whatever tool I'm using, and then just you know reach across. 
And so, you know, the weather was nice, so I took it outside to deburr the holes in all the stringers, and as you can see, I'm using my uh, hex deburring bit in the, um, in the little cordless screwdriver. Uh, kind of alternating tools there. You know, you don't want to put a lot of pressure if you're using the cordless screwdriver, especially you don't want to bear down on anything. But, uh, you know, I can just uh, use the weight of the tool, really. And, um, you know, just a very light pressure. And so, obviously deburring all the holes up under the flange of the spar. All right, so now I'm deburring all the holes in the horizontal stabilizer skins. Lots of holes, so I better get started. I'm going to use my little hex bit here. Um, probably just twist it in my fingers for a lot of this. Also have, whoops, the uh, my little cordless screwdriver that I can put it in. Uh, this thing, especially on the skins, I want to go really carefully because, of course, you don't want to. You're not trying to countersink the holes or anything like that. It's just deburring and you know, especially on the, the thin skins, you really don't want to take off too much. And uh, I did, I bought these little, couple little hex bit extensions that you know, I can just use to twist in my fingers. I actually bought them to, to get the inside of the uh, rib flange uh, holes and you know, to be able to reach across and, and uh, twist them like that. But it also just, you know, turns this into a nice little tool and at least you're not as cramped up and it adds a little weight um, so I've found that you know I can just sort of set this in the hole let the weight of the of the tool apply the pressure and, and just give it a quick twist and that's pretty good for deburring holes in skin and whatnot so also got the little uh, the more normal I suppose the more standard deburring tool I don't know that any one of these does any better job than the other really uh, you know from a practical standpoint I just, I get tired of twisting this thing, and so I'll use this thing for a while, or I'll put it in the screwdriver and just go very carefully. Um, luckily with my little googly eyes here, the nice thing about these is you know, I can pretty much see exactly uh, how much of a, of a, how much I'm taking off there. So, um, you know, I can, I can get consistent results to, regardless of which tool I end up using. So anyway, lots of holes. So, away I go. Alright, so I've deburred all the holes on all the inside surfaces of the horizontal stabilizer skins. Now, I've got to peel the blue stuff off and do all the outside surfaces. So, uh, if anybody's curious, it was 244 holes, assuming I counted right. Uh, but I counted them when I did this, this last panel. And uh, I also timed it, so it took me a little over, um, a little under 15 minutes to you know, do all the holes and come back with the Scotch Bright and, and then sort of you know, feel it and inspect it. And uh, so, you know, there's basically eight, you know, eight times that because it's each each panel or each side, inside and outside, and then two skins. So there's that a little under a thousand holes and couple of hours worth of work uh, by the time all is said and done. So not too bad, really. Um, you know, it's just sort of tedious and repetitive and whatever. Uh, so on to the outsides. So after my inability to multiply by eight, I thought I would at least end uh, showing this clever little trick to get the blue vinyl off of the outside of the skins. Not, I didn't come up with this, of course. Everybody uh, seems to know to roll it off onto a pipe or a you know broom handle or whatever, but um, you know I thought this worked pretty well, sort of laying it upside down on it and and uh, you know rolling it along on the table and then flipping it over and letting gravity help me out here. So um, anyway, and uh, you know one thing I've learned is that w once you get sort of a, a wad, a roll of of the blue stuff on on your piece of pipe or whatever you know broom handle, whatever you're using, it's actually best to leave that stuff on there for next time. It helps you stick the the next layer of blue stuff and get it started. Uh, so anyway, uh, just a lot more deburring. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end this one here. Uh, but this is it. This is the last of the deburring, uh, just the outsides of these skins, and then that's it.